Today on Satan's Splain, I'll be answering miscellaneous mail messages on topics such as Marilyn Manson and marijuana. Yes, quite an M-filled episode with me, Magister M, here on Satan's Splain. Well, it's not Satan worship, it's Satanism. It's embracing the life-enriching things which have traditionally been given the devil's name. Pride, lust, earthly success, rational self-interest, atheism, humor, nonconformity, science, a passion for living, being selective about whom we love. We don't see these as shameful sins, but empowering ideals. And we also recognize the psychological power and fun of symbolism and aesthetics, so we utilize Satan as mythology's most fitting mascot for what we're about. Satan Splain, Satanic Talk with Church of Satan Magister Bill M. Magister Bill M. here with Satan Splain. I've got some listener mail that I'll be answering in this episode. First, though, I just want to talk about something I did somewhat recently. I want to talk a little bit about tuning out the news and uh, what that was like. So, as most of you have probably heard and already saw, uh, several weeks back, I was a guest on a show called Tuning Out the News, T O O N. ING, tuning out the news. It has Stephen Colbert's name on it. The full name of the show is actually Stephen Colbert Presents Tuning Out the News on Comedy Central. So, as the name implies, it airs on Comedy Central weekly, I think it is, after The Daily Show. And it's a satirical news show where they will take one or more real-life people and show them being interviewed by or as part of a discussion panel with several animated characters. So what happened was they had contacted the Church of Satan, seen if one of our representatives was interested in being on. Other folks in the council said, hey, Comedy Central, uh, do you want to do this one, Bill? I mean, you're kind of the comedy guy with the devil's mischief and Dr. Shits and all that. Or Magister David Harris, maybe. You've done professional work in that industry, so... I ended up saying yes first, then I got in contact with the producer from Comedy Central, and we worked out the details. To read you some of their initial letter to the Church of Satan, they said, quote, We are a satirical, half-animated news program that brings on live guests as experts. We're currently looking for someone to come on the show and give our audience insight into the Church of Satan. We'd ask some questions about advice prayers, readings for those interested in the church. The call should be about 15 minutes. You'll notice they mentioned prayers. As I'm sure most of you listeners already know, Satanism doesn't have prayers because, you know, we don't believe in deities, so prayers don't really make any sense since there's no one to pray to. We do, of course, have our invocations, the conjurings, and things like the Enochian keys and so on, but uh, they are not prayers. They are ritual readings, though, so... I figured, you know, the uh, these producers and stuff, they would want to hear something like that on television for dramatic flair. So I had my satanic Bible ready, just in case. Alas, as some of you saw in the final clip that aired, nothing like that uh, ended up happening anyway. Before anything started, though, uh, the producer sent me a sample clip of the show and said, you know, this is what it would be kind of like. It would be a mock interview, a mock discussion. And she assured me that they wouldn't be doing anything to make me look bad. She said, uh, don't speak unless being asked a direct question and don't try to be funny. Just play it serious. And I told her that I understood that part because that's sometimes how comedy works in situations like this. It's a formula that goes all the way back to Abbott and Costello or Laurel and Hardy or other vaudeville stuff. You have one person being zany and, you know, making the jokes and the other person acting serious, or what's known in comedy as being the straight man, playing the straight man, playing it straight. And it's this contrast of uh, opposites that makes it all funny. So anyway, the same sort of thing here. And one other thing the producer said uh, was, you know, now these people who are going to be interviewing you, they're, they're playing characters. They'll be people who act really overconfident, but it's clear to everybody else that they've done absolutely no research on what they're talking about. And I told her, um, that actually sounds like most of the people who interview the Church of Satan. So uh, she got a good laugh out of that. 
So uh, the time came for the call. I worked with an engineer for a long, long time trying to get everything right in terms of lighting and sound and all that. Try moving this thing over here. Try putting some books under the camera to raise it. Try leaning over this way. Lean over that way. Can we change the lighting and so on? And he thanked me for being patient through all of that. And I said, hey, I've been doing a podcast for 20 years now. You know, the devil's mischief. So believe me. I know the frustration of trying to correct flaws in the sound alone. Plus, I, I said to him, I know you're asking me to do all this because you want me to look and sound the best I can. So, you know, again, completely understand. I appreciate putting the work into this. So finally, it came time for the call. And the 15 minutes was just surreal. I mean, here I am being thrown into this discussion panel with all these comedians playing characters and talking a mile a minute and saying things that purposely don't make much of any sense and then asking me questions that are intentionally loaded. And I'm trying to think fast on my feet without trying to be funny or trying to be too witty. And this goes on for 15 minutes, which includes a prank phone call in the middle to a bookstore. I wasn't expecting that at all. They edited everything down to like whatever it ended up being, seven minutes. Um, because as you can imagine, there were some jokes they made that just bombed or just didn't work otherwise. And I've got to be really, really blunt here. Tuning out the news, along with most stuff that Stephen Colbert is involved in, it's not so much comedy, but it's really political propaganda. It's like political propaganda with a laugh track. I hate to say it, but that's really how I see it. Long, long gone are the days when comedy used to pick on everybody, when you could watch Saturday Night Live and they would lampoon whoever the president was, Republican or Democrat. And it was first and foremost about good impersonations and lots of fun, nothing overly personal. We, we would see Dana Carvey do his awesome impersonation of George Herbert Walker Bush, and it wasn't like a personal attack. Mad Magazine, same thing. I had a subscription to Mad Magazine for years and years and years when I was young. They made fun of Clinton, they made fun of Bush, made fun of Obama, made fun of all different sorts of things in the news and subcultures. But these days, uh, I don't know, it's like all one-sided, and it, it, I think it makes for shitty comedy. Actually, South Park, I would say, is an exception. Thankfully, South Park still makes fun of everybody, last I checked, with all those specials they did in recent years. But I think that's about it. Having said all of that, though, I did have fun doing Tuning Out the News. And uh, as somebody who has been a devoted fan of comedy all my life, I am proud to say I was on Comedy Central in some way or another, even if it was like seven minutes, and only part of the seven minutes from there. They could have been one of those shows where they trashed me and went for the cheap jokes about a Satanist in the house, but they didn't, and they paid me a good amount of money, too, for being there, so there's that. So that's all I had to say about uh, my experience on that show. Let us move on to some listener mail. A few episodes ago, I answered a question from a listener named Stephen. He had uh, shot me this Additional email, though, which I don't think I talked about at all. And he wrote, quote, I had a meet and greet with Marilyn Manson, a.k.a. Brian Warner, years and years ago. And I had known about Satanism at this point. But I decided to ask him about a lot of things. And he said some things that I've remembered throughout the years, but don't exactly match up with Satanism. And... I still don't know where he stands in the Church of Satan. So, to answer the question Stephen asks of uh, where exactly Marilyn Manson stands with Satanism and with the Church of Satan, I'll try to share what I know. First of all, I'm sure many are aware of who shock rocker Marilyn Manson is. Um, you know, I I've personally, I've never been much of a Marilyn Manson fan myself. I tried to get into his music, and I just couldn't. I saw him in concert a few times, and uh, I enjoyed the show, so I thought he put on a great show. But he's never been a music act I just personally ended up liking at all. 
Now, I am a longtime Alice Cooper fanatic, and it was through talking to other Alice Cooper fans that I first heard about Marilyn Manson sometime in the 1990s. Everybody was making comparisons, and to be fair, my own initial impression was, hmm, let's see, a, a skinny guy with black hair and a woman's first name who does shocking theatrics on stage. Where have I heard about that before? I came to realize, though, that, you know, the similarities between Marilyn Manson and Alice Cooper kind of end there, especially musically. You know, they're very different, so... I don't jump on the bandwagon of people who hate Marilyn Manson for the sake of hating Marilyn Manson or, uh, you know, dismiss him as just an Alice Cooper ripoff and nothing more. Nah. Now, regarding Marilyn Manson and the Church of Satan, he was indeed a member of the Church of Satan. He wrote the foreword to uh, the book Satan Speaks, which was the 1998 posthumous book of essays by Anton Zandor LeVay. And Marilyn Manson's own personal story about meeting Anton LaVey at the original Church of Satan headquarters was uh, well documented. He wrote all about it in a chapter of his autobiography, The Long Hard Road Out of Hell. I actually read that, and um, I actually found it to be a really great read, not just the chapter, but the whole book itself. And once again, not a fan of uh, Marilyn Manson, really, in his music, but... Um, was a good book, I gotta say. Now, I know that uh, before Manson had ever met Anton LaVey, he had met Magus Peter H. Gilmore several times. Manson was an up-and-coming rock star at the time. And for those who lived through the era, and those who remember, Marilyn Manson got huge in popularity. For a lot of young people, it's, you know, his book and his interviews were the first time they may have even heard about Satanism, or Anton LaVey, or the Church of Satan. And because of all that, he did end up bringing a new wave of members to the Church of Satan. Um, I know some Satanists who had grown up listening to Marilyn Manson in their young years, joined the Church of Satan, and are still in the Church of Satan today. So, how much of a Satanist was... Marilyn Manson, really? Was his heart really into it? I don't know. There was an interview he gave in 1996 where he said regarding Satanism, quote, By no means is that the only idea I base myself to. I incorporate many different things into who I am and what I'm about, including Christianity. So the impression I get is that uh, Manson was... Mm, not a Satanist so much as one of these cafeteria religion types, you know, or buffet religions, if you will, that uh, maybe had a notable amount of Satanism on the plate. Again, this is just going by his own description of himself, really. I know I've talked before about this kind of approach to religion. Some people fancy themselves as more honest or independent for doing something like that, the cafeteria approach, but... I would argue they really aren't. It's one thing if you're still searching for a path or trying to see if Satanism or some other path is right for you. I mean, by all means, go explore what's out there. That's what I did when I was younger. But then you have these compulsively non-committal types who want to shout from the rooftops how their label is the label of having no label and so on. In my experience, these people a lot of times uh, tend to be smug and not really independent, just more scatterbrained. I mean, a plate of buffet food may look more diverse, I suppose, but uh, usually not of a good quality. But enough about that. In 2001, Marilyn Manson was being interviewed by Bill O'Reilly. You might remember that interview on uh, Fox News or the, the O'Reilly Factor or whatever his show was called. And Bill O'Reilly asked him, you're a minister in the Church of Satan, right? Marilyn Manson's answer was, no, not necessarily. That was a friend of mine who's now dead, who was a philosopher that I learned a lot from. And that was a title I was given, and a lot of people made a lot out of it. It's not a real job. I transcribed that word for word, and uh, now I remember a lot of 
fellow Church of Satan members hearing this at the time were thinking, well, there he goes. He blew us off. He's disavowed himself from the Church of Satan. And honestly, that wasn't my interpretation of what Marilyn Manson said. The way I saw it, Bill O'Reilly was asking him explicitly if he was a minister of the Church of Satan. And personally, I took Manson's answer as him saying, oh, no, I'm not a minister in the sense of somebody who goes before a congregation of people and reads verses from a book and gives out an evil Eucharist wafer or something like that. No, no, no. See, I was given a priesthood title by Anton LaVey because he knew me really well, and it was actually an honorary title. It's not a clergy duty. So my honest take of the Bill O'Reilly interview is that that is more of what Marilyn Manson meant by his answer. And maybe also Manson might have been thinking, well, hmm, Bill O'Reilly is going to give me five minutes to talk here, assuming he doesn't demand people cut off my microphone if I say something he doesn't like, which you know, he has been known to do with other people. I could try answering his questions about Satanism, but hmm, I doubt it would go anywhere, so let me steer the conversation away rather than feed O'Reilly's fire and brimstone. So, you know, maybe he was thinking something more along those lines. But fast forward to 2015, or thereabouts, Marilyn Manson does an Ask Me Anything interview on Reddit, where he says, quote, I never considered myself a Satanist. I was a part of the Church of Satan with an honorary position simply because it was one philosophy, because I never looked at it as a religion. Anton LaVey taught me a lot of things about life. And then he rambled on about other things like the power of the mind and the power of music and blah, blah, blah. So some of you may be wondering, why was he given a priesthood title if he wasn't even a Satanist? Well, Anton LaVey would do this sort of thing on rare occasion where he would give an honorary membership or title to some entertainer that he thought was doing something satanic for the world or especially for the Church of Satan. In the case of Marilyn Manson, Again, his popularity did get the word out about Satanism, out to millions of people. And there are Satanists to this day who say that it was thanks to Marilyn Manson that they heard about Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. So that whole thing was a great wave for us. But, of course, a wave doesn't last forever. It wasn't the first. It wasn't the last. Like all specific waves, it came and went. In any case, after Anton LaVey died in 1997, Manson seemingly dropped contact with the Church of Satan. I mean, he wrote the book introduction for Satan Speaks a year later, but not much else, as far as I recall. We saw that happen with a few other people, where I think it revealed that these members were maybe more about being Anton LaVey fans than being Satanists more about the man than the religion. Um, there was another interview I vaguely remember more recently where Manson was asked where his Church of Satan membership card was, and his answer was something along the lines of, well, I don't know, I'm sure it's around here somewhere, LOL, if I still have it. So, you know, after all of that, when people would ask the Church of Satan whether Melon Manson was a priest, we would have to shrug and say, he doesn't talk to us anymore, he doesn't check in, so we can only conclude that uh, he hasn't really wanted to have anything to do with us since LeVay died, and he said this and this in this interview. So no, for all intents and purposes, he's not part of us anymore. We'll, we'll go with that. Not because of any change in the Church of Satan. We didn't change our beliefs or how we run things. Um, again, I'd say... Marilyn Manson didn't really have his heart into it in the first place and has shown that with the interviews over the past 20 plus years. Then, well, after all of that, there was the news that uh, Evan Rachel Wood came out with claims of spousal abuse. I honestly don't know the details of all of that, but if it's true, certainly doesn't sound like anything the Church of Satan would condone. So I have no idea what he's up to. I don't pay much attention to what he's specifically up to these days, because like I said, I was never 
a fan of his music in the first place, to be honest. Didn't pay much attention before. Now, having said all that, if you are a Satanist and you personally like Marilyn Manson's music, that's fine. Listen to whatever turns you on. The Church of Satan is not here to tell you what music you can and can't listen to. That's something Christian churches do, you know? If Antichrist Superstar, that CD, was the soundtrack of your youth and some part of your satanic core, so be it. Nobody can take that away from you. But as for Marilyn Manson, the man, offstage, and his strange relationship with Satanism and the Church of Satan, well, what I've told you is what I've got. That's all I can tell you. My favorite rock star is Alice Cooper, who is a Christian, so believe me, I know how it can be a letdown when you hear your favorite rock star say something you flat out reject. It doesn't make me stop being a fan of his music, of course. I did once have a couple Satanists many years ago try to tell me that there was something wrong with that, like I wasn't allowed to listen to Alice Cooper because he's a Christian. And, well, people who think that can go fuck themselves. Let's take a break right now. You are listening to Satan's Plane. You are listening to Satan's Plane, real satanic talk with Church of Satan Magister Bill M. For questions, comments, and correspondence, send an email to bill at satansplane.com. The rich came up to me and they said they want to get in the kingdom of heaven. I said, well, it was easier for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get in the kingdom of heaven. That was pretty surreal of you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd been smoking a bit that day. <laughs> but the rich, they got huge blenders and put camels into them and they made them into liquid camel and then they squirted them with very fine jets through the eyes of needles. So they're all coming up now. If you like religion bashing laughter and other comedy that's not made for the masses, then check out The Devil's Mischief. Visit devilsmischief.com for more details. The Devil's Mischief, carnal comedy clips and other world novelty numbers available on Radio Free Satan. Magister Bill M. with Satan Splain. Visit the official website of the show, satansplain.com. There you can listen to all of the past Satan Splain episodes. You can also listen to Satan Splain on Stitcher, Spotify, Audible, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and more. You can find some of those direct links handy on satansplain.com. Satan's Plane is also on social media, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Give the show a like and subscribe or a follow or whatever it is. If you can do that on any of these platforms, that really helps me out. And of course, for questions and comments, you can email me. Bill at satansplain.com is the email address. Speaking of email, let us read this email I received from Nikki. Nikki writes, Hey Bill, big fan here. I am a Satanist, though not a member of the Church of Satan, and a cannabis user from Oregon, where it has been legalized. Being a Satanist, I don't feel I need permission to enjoy my legal vices. However, since cannabis has become more and more of an acceptable drug of choice, I've noticed there hasn't been many official opinions from high-ranking members of the Church of Satan, save for Darren Deicide's interview in High Times. I figure it may be an interesting topic for the show. In my own opinion, it is much like alcohol. So long as the individual is taking care not to let the vice control them, who gives a shit? Smoking a joint after work is much different than living life constantly stoned, much like enjoying a glass of whiskey is different than being a red-nosed drunkard. Indulgence, not compulsion. Thanks, Nikki. So I wrote back to Nikki, and I'm going to read you a mix of my reply and a bunch of other related thoughts. In short, I concur with the opinion he gave. But this does bring up some side topics that are worth Satan's planning. I want to talk about drug legality versus illegality. I want to talk about Satanism's false affiliation with the illegal drugs and why the Church of Satan takes the stances it takes against it. I want to talk about a representative's personal view versus delivering a point on an official position of whatever he or she is a representative of. And on that last point, I want to share my own personal views on marijuana. Now, Nikki mentions right off the bat that he is using marijuana where it is perfectly legal to do so in the state of Oregon. 
Over here, where I am on the East Coast, marijuana is similarly legal in the state of Massachusetts, illegal in some of the surrounding states. And the legality of the substance is very important here, and it's worth explaining why. You see, one complaint I've heard from people over the years is, oh, I don't understand why the Church of Satan is against the use of illegal drugs. I mean, after all, I'm a Satanist. I am my own God. I should be able to do marijuana, or for that matter, cocaine or LSD, or anything else that happens to be illegal, because I decide what's right for me, not religion or the government. So the Church of Satan should openly support that. Otherwise, you're just being obedient, herd conformist, and letting the power of the state rule over you, blah, 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 blah. So, to be clear, this is not what Nikki was saying at all in his email to me. I realize that. But again, there are idiots who have made arguments like the ones I just rattled off. And there are a couple of big points that they miss. First of all, many of these people are not old enough, it seems, to remember the Satanic Panic. One of the many things that Satanists were accused of doing, besides torturing animals and baby sacrifice and all that, was reckless use of drugs. In the 1980s, you see... There was all this drug use, there was hysteria about drugs, there was hysteria about heavy metal music, and kidnapping, and Satanism, and it was all considered related. That was part of the hysteria. So if you did one thing, it was a gateway to the rest. I mean, I don't know if you ever saw the Dragnet movie. There was a movie based on the TV show Dragnet, uh, the movie starring Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. And the movie was straight out of the Satanic Panic. So in, in the movie, they play these two cops and they go undercover and show up at a secret pagan slash satanic ritual. And besides the virgin sacrifice, there are also handfuls of complimentary drugs being handed out. Again, this was the image. This is what they were conflating everything into. So when you consider accusations like the drugs and besides other illegal activities that Satanists have been accused of doing, the Church of Satan just had to be pragmatic and say, look, our policy is that we don't condone illegal activity. I'm pretty sure I talked about this on Satan's Plane before, but I had an idiot just a few months ago, I think on Twitter, trying to argue this point with me, saying like, well, Satanism is about indulgence and being your own god, so you should be okay with illegal drugs. And my question back to him was, what do you expect us to do then? State publicly as a matter of policy? Yes, we're an organization and we're okay with some people breaking the law sometimes. I mean, forget all of the philosophical arguments here of whether, you know, it's right or wrong or getting some elaborate hypothetical scenario where you try to make it seem like stealing is the moral thing and so on. Just think about this practically. Forget also the fact that we're the Church of Satan. Forget that Satanists have been accused of all sorts of horrific crimes, as well as crimes involving illegal drugs. Let me ask you this. What organization, satanic or otherwise, would publicly state, yes, we're okay with breaking the law in some cases? You wouldn't do that because that would just be asking for trouble. For starters, you're practically asking for law enforcement to investigate you and breathe down your neck. As if Satanism hasn't already had more than its fair share of that. And plus, if you're an organization who explicitly says you're okay with people breaking the law in some cases, then you're basically saying, hey, criminals welcome. And opening the door of membership to people you probably don't want in your organization in the first place. Of course, getting back to the original email... Nikki is not asking about illegal drugs here. He's asking about legalized marijuana. I know that. But, you see, the topic of marijuana still has all of that baggage of the topic of illegal drugs and its whole history, whether you like it or not. So, I thought this was a point worth Satan-splaining. Moving on, uh, now Nikki mentions Reverend Darren Deicide. I think it was last year or the year before, High Times Magazine reached out to the Church of Satan. Um, High Times Magazine, for those who don't know, is a magazine for marijuana enthusiasts, really. 
It's been around for decades. But in any case, they interviewed Darren Deicide. Um, I guess as I understand it, he's a recreational marijuana user. Much better that they interviewed him and <laughs> not me, given the topic. And although he is a representative of the Church of Satan, he is a priest, his views on marijuana, you see, are going to be his. Just like how earlier I gave my thoughts on Alice Cooper. That, that doesn't mean my position is the official Church of Satan's stance on Alice Cooper. The, the Church of Satan doesn't have an official stance on Alice Cooper or this band or drinking coffee or other things I happen to like. We don't need to have that. It would it'd be silly. You would think that this is a simple enough concept for everybody to understand, so some of you may be wondering why am I bothering to explain it at all? Why am I bothering to explain that there's a difference between the personal views or tastes of a representative and that person speaking for the organization as a whole? But once again, this is a concept that seems to be lost on some people out there. Not Nikki, once again, not Nikki, but other people. And once again, this goes beyond Satanism, beyond the Church of Satan. Some people, especially in this day and age of identity politics, can't tell apart this concept of a representative or, or just, just a member of a group doing something that's not necessarily a view or official policy of the group itself. I remember some years ago, Magistra Peggy Dramia the high priestess of the Church of Satan, had gone to a political protest of sorts in New York. And, of course, some idiots were whining online, Oh my God, the Church of Satan says it's not political, but the high priestess went to a political protest. Why did she do that? Well, it's because she still has her life. She wanted to do it. It was a political protest that she felt was in her best interest, so she went. Not there to represent the Church of Satan, not to represent Satanism, she went as an individual. Once again, not a difficult concept for most people whose IQ is in the triple digits, but somehow this eludes people. Before I get back to the topic of marijuana, I just want to say something about drugs in general. Oh, and to anybody listening who wants to make the argument, hey man, marijuana isn't a drug, it's an herb. No, 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 no. Rosemary is an herb. Sage is an herb. THC is a drug. People use it for the drug, the THC, and its effects on the body. Not because of the herbal part of hemp. Show me some parsley growing from the ground containing THC, and then we'll talk. Anyway, I remember once running into one of these people who was upset with the Church of Satan's position on illegal drugs, and she tried to argue, well, I don't know if Anton LaVey really understood the topic. I think maybe he was just older and, and not knowledgeable about, you know, drugs and the culture. And my response to that is, um, Anton LaVey was a working musician in the 1960s, living in San Francisco. Do you really think he had no first-hand observations or knowledge of the drug scene? Really? 1960s San Francisco. And he just didn't know much of anything about drugs. Sure, okay. If anything, I think his experiences helped further shape his position. Because on the one hand, he saw the heavy conservatives with their religion and their irrational guilt over sex. While on the other extreme, he saw the hippie movement, which was liberating in some ways, but also filled with freeloaders and people being equally absurd with collectivism, other kind of collectivism, irrational pacifism for that manner, and becoming slaves to the drugs, and uh, the dropout culture and all that. And the Church of Satan stood for things that, uh, you know, was kind of blasphemous to both the radical right wings and radical left wings. And uh, it's still kind of like that today. Now, specifically with drugs... Anton LaVey points out in The Satanic Witch and some other writings that being in a drugged state doesn't really work in the ritual chamber, for example. Now, drugs expand the mind, okay, but he argued that they do so at the expense of the emotions. And in the ritual chamber, you, wanna, you want escapism? Yeah, sure, but you also want control. You want control of your own thoughts. 
the ability to focus your thoughts, and doing that high is not really the way to go about it. But Bill, you called marijuana a drug. Alcohol is a drug too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you shouldn't be conducting a ritual when you're drunk either. Well, Bill, caffeine is a drug too, and you do that. Yes, another cliche argument that potheads love to use. And to that I say, mm, I don't know anybody who's fucked up a ritual because they mix uh, black coffee and black candles. So, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, doesn't really apply either. Let me get back to Nikki's letter and the topic of marijuana. Here are my own personal views on marijuana. Are you ready? I'm going to be um, blunt, so to speak. Okay, bad choice of words. But here are my own personal views. Are you ready? Brace yourselves. I fucking hate marijuana. I abhor pot. I hate pot culture. I find stoners to be incredibly annoying. And I say this as a long-haired musician who's played coffee houses, who votes libertarian, who has been a rabid fan of the Black Crows since their first single was on the charts in 1990 and own every Black Crows album. I own every Cheech and Chong album. Yes, I know it's hard to believe when you look at all that that I am somebody who hates pot, but there you have it. And of course, whenever I say that, I'll hear some people who say, oh, well, Bill, that's because you just haven't tried it. No, 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 I tried it. I tried it several times. I can totally understand why somebody might like that feeling of being high, but uh, I don't. I hated it. I hated not being able to think. I'm just somebody who loves self-control and flexing my analytical mind. Oh, uh, well, Bill, you probably just got some bad pot. Nope, nope. I know it wasn't bad pot because it was in the same batch that my friends had, and they found it fine. Oh, well, Bill, there must have been a reason why... No, 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 no. See, I'm just a person who doesn't like pot. If you're somebody who can't bear to accept the fact that somebody else may dislike something you adore... Mm, that's a you problem. Now, once again, having said all of that, I am still in agreement with most of what Nikki said. If you want to go smoke pot at home, you're not bothering anybody about it, you're not doing anything irresponsible with it, then fine, I don't care. Why should I care? It's your body, not mine. It's your leisure time, not mine. There are some foods I hate. But as long as I'm not the one eating them and you keep those foods and the smells away from me, I don't really care. But what I particularly like about what Nikki pointed out in his email is that just as there are people who can drink responsibly and there are people who are alcoholics, there's likewise a difference between somebody who, you know, takes some hits off a joint at a party and somebody who gets stoned so hard and so often it's it's like their worldview revolves around it and the reason why i'm glad nikki pointed this out is because i run into so many people who insist that this latter category doesn't exist for pot that you know marijuana is completely harmless and in fact it's healthy for you and it's absolutely impossible to be addicted and so on which is not true and what I told Nikki is that, you know, what annoys me the most are these pro-pot ideologues, there's really no better word for them than ideologues, who claim that pot, you know, again, that pot addicts don't exist, that the drug is absolutely harmless. I mean, I really wish more pot users would just have the honesty to say, look, I enjoy getting high. And I think marijuana should be legalized because I want to be able to have a bong in my living room and smoke responsibly, get high without bothering anybody. And I should be able to do that without having to fear going to jail. I'd be fine if they said that, because you know what? That, to me, is a perfectly legitimate argument, as far as I'm concerned. But that's not what I hear. Over the years, instead, what I usually hear from that crowd is, oh, well, you know, hemp would solve all the world's problems with the destruction of the rainforest to make paper. And did you know it's been prescribed to glaucoma patients? And did you know 
Marijuana can cure 87 different kinds of cancer, and the founding fathers smoked pot, and it's a sacred sacred herb to the hooky hoo tribe. And oh, it's better than alcohol. Alcohol is harmful, and people who say pot makes you lazy are racist. It's racism because there was something I read on the internet about Mexicans and marijuana and propaganda. So there is quite simply a blind ideology I see almost always surrounding marijuana. And this most especially extends to the fact that pot has become one of society's sacred cows. It, it's one of these things that society has decided you're not allowed to say anything bad about. Now, as a Satanist, I find that curious indeed. What I used to do every year on Facebook, I used to do this kind of a prank. Um, on April 20th every year, you know, 420, what I would do is I would change my profile on Facebook to a picture of a marijuana leaf with a red circle and a slash over it. And it was a fun social experiment because inevitably I would get like so much shit for it. I mean, I could post pictures of inverted crosses and not get much of a reaction. I could make Holocaust jokes. I could change my profile picture to the word Allah written in bacon strips. I did that for my cover photo before. But say something bad about marijuana. Oof. Forget it. Try that online sometime. Try saying something... You don't have to change your avatar. Just try saying something critical of pot, just as an interesting experiment. And you'll find that people who don't even use the stuff at all will have this strange compulsion to go defend it. In fact, when I did episode 500 of The Devil's Mischief, this was several years back, the theme I did, it was a Black Mass episode. So you see, in the Satanic Bible, Anton LaVey points out that the Black Mass, the traditional Black Mass, might be a cathartic exercise to blaspheme, to help you emotionally purge religious programming out of your system. But uh, to be frank, it is not really blasphemous by today's standards because, you see, Christianity is not the most sacred thing to people anymore. So, LeVay argues that if you were going to do a real Black Mass from modern times, you would instead do a ritual attacking the sacred cows of today. The things which society says you're not allowed to condemn. To, uh, condemn. So, needless to say, for episode 500 of The Devil's Mischief, I played comedy that said bad things about marijuana and Star Wars, cats, and other things like that. Things that you're just not allowed to criticize. And I did that again when uh, the Devil's Reign art show had a theme one particular year, the theme of uh, psychedelic blasphemy. So I did an Andy Warhol-looking piece condemning modern sacred cows. I made another art piece, which uh, did not make it into the book. They chose that one, not the other. But anyway, you get the idea. So in summary, final thoughts on marijuana. Marijuana's bad, bad. Okay, sorry, another South Park reference. So seriously, though, final thoughts on marijuana. A lot of this comes down to um, what's obvious to most Satanists. Indulgence versus compulsion. Using it versus being used by it. And uh, remembering, of course, that it's not an indulgence for somebody if they don't like it or they otherwise don't want to do it in the first place. And if you don't like it, it's not abstinence not to do it. It is not a completely harmless drug. Sorry, stoners. No matter what the ideologues tell you, there is medical evidence. It's not a harmless drug. It is not without its risks, even for all users at all. I know not all users at all levels are not all at the same level of risk, of course. And the utopia that some potheads thought would happen if it became legalized, well, I haven't seen it happen. I live in a state where it's legal, and the only change I've really noticed is uh, I just smell it in more places in public. But uh, crime seems to be the same, taxes seem to be the same, both worse, actually. I'm not blaming pot for that. I'm just pointing out the fact that, uh, yeah, making it legal didn't really magically bring a utopia, as some people thought it would. 
And of course, you can like something without being part of the collective surrounding it. Just as you can like a particular band, even if you think most of the fan base are idiots. Or you can be gay without being part of the activism surrounding that. You can smoke marijuana without being part of the whole pothead subculture surrounding it. And finally, whether you partake in pot or don't partake, if you find yourself feeling automatically defensive and defending a plant, you may want to stop and ask yourself why. Remember, religion does not have a monopoly on sacred cows that you're not allowed to challenge. And I was going to end the show right here, but you know what? I think we certainly have some time to read a satanic dote. Yes, let us close with a satanic anecdote. Cue the satanic dote theme song. Satanic anecdotes. Satanic dotes. So after Stephen sent me the question about Marilyn Manson, he also sent me this satanic dote. Stephen writes, I've been a Satanist since my early to mid-twenties. I'm in my late thirties now and a member of the Church of Satan since 2020. Up until recently, I had a side gig as a bouncer at a local biker bar. During that time, the staff and most customers knew about my beliefs, but I rarely ever talked about it. One night, a local musician came in. I hadn't seen him in over a year. I asked him how he'd been, and he proceeded to tell me all about how he had found Jesus again and changed his life and was now playing music at a local church. He said his pastor had told him that he was possessed by Leviathan, and he needed to be exercised. Now, mind you, I was wearing my Baphomet pendant this entire time. He then asked me if I have ever heard of Leviathan. Excitedly, I said, absolutely, but have you also heard the band Belial? Afterwards, he got very drunk, and I had to help him into a cab. Hope you got a kick out of that. Well, thank you, Stephen, for that satanic dote. And to that, I say thank you for listening to Satan's Plane. Until next time, hail Satan. You have been listening to Satan's Plane. For more information about the show, visit the official website at satansplane.com. And for more information about Satanism itself, visit churchofsatan.com. This episode, copyright 2023, Magister Bill M.